So hello everyone and welcome to the LEDNET webinar on advances in genomics and its role in healthcare and precision medicine. Um, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. We're hoping that through this webinar, we touch on some of the advances in genomics, how it's used in healthcare and precision medicine and answer some of your questions. Today's webinar is part of an ongoing series of webinars that LEDNET has been running um, on several interesting topics ranging from cryptocurrency and blockchain to 5G and digital transformation, to the challenge and rewards of entrepreneurship in an early career setting, to uh, impact of COVID-19 on technology. So if you've missed any of the LabNet webinars, I strongly encourage you to watch them. They are all available on YouTube, as will this webinar in uh, 24 hours from now. So um, a few housekeeping items, everyone other than the panelists will be muted. At any time, if you have questions, please uh, send them via the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we will select a few to address in the last 20 minutes of the webinar. And if you have any logistical issues, please send a chat to Janine Aie, our LabNet Executive Director, who is on this webinar. And with this, let me hand it over to Janine to take us through the next couple of slides. Thank you, Omaima. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our esteemed panelists, moderator, and to our attendees. Being the executive director for LabNet since March of 2021 has been the best gig of my life. It is very rewarding to connect with like-minded Lebanese and give back to our community. About LabNet, it is the premier network for high-tech professionals of Lebanese descent in North America. It started some 20 years ago in Silicon Valley with a handful of people and is now over 2000 members and friends of LabNet. We have 13 regional communities in major North American cities and three professional communities, women in tech, you're gonna hear more about it in a bit, early in career and biotech. Our mission sits on three pillars, network and feature our members through expert pieces, interviews, webinars, and networking events, Nurture our next generation with programs such as internships, providing North American opportunities for our students in North America, Lebanon, and the Middle East, early in career community, mentorship and partnerships with major universities in Lebanon and in North America through the Lebanese Collegiate Network. Last pillar, and very important given Lebanon's situation, is connecting and giving back to Lebanon through fundraisers, startup support, and other programs. Our main initiatives for 2022 are communities revival to increase membership engagement and growth, continue supporting our youth of Lebanese descent through various programs, and fundraising to help us increase our reach and impact. Stay tuned to upcoming quarterly webinars and networking events. Check us out at lebnet.us and please consider becoming a subscribed member. If you have any questions, you can reach me at janine at lebnet.us. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our fearless women in tech community leader, Layar Ruhana, who will tell you more about her community's initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Janine, um, for the intro. My name is Layar Ruhana. I am a senior staff engineer at Illumina and I'm leading the Women in Tech community at LabNet. Right now, our community boasts 421 um, 20 LabNet members, and we're looking to grow this constituency. Our mission is centered in and supporting the next generation of women in tech leaders and to grow our constituency. I'm highlighting here um, our amazing uh, committee leaders who are working tirelessly towards achieving uh, WIT mission. We want to wish everyone happy International Women's Day um, this week. The theme is break the bias and hopefully we're all working towards creating a bias-free society for gender um, for a more sustainable tomorrow. During this month uh, of March, which is Women History Month, LabNet will be featuring uh, women in tech leaders and their inspiring journeys. So please stay tuned on LabNet the social media for these inspiring journeys. Um, through WIT, we host many programs tailored to empower and feature women in tech professionals, and you can find 
uh, all of uh, this programming on LabNet social media or on the YouTube channel. If you are interested to join us, um, you could do so by joining us at labnet.us and becoming a member. Next, please. We are very excited and honored today as a women in tech community to be hosting this amazing panel um, with this great, uh, with this, uh, you know, great set of panelists. Um, let me start by introducing our moderator, Omaima Al Awar. Uh, Omaima is a director of sales at uh, Illumina. She joined LoveNet this past year. Omaima is a research scientist by training. She has a PhD in biology from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, followed by a postdoc at NIH, where she focused on membrane trafficking, a fundamental cellular process. Over the past 20 years, she transitioned to the commercial side of science, holding various positions in the fields of sales and marketing. And over the past 11 years, she has been at Illumina, a genomics company that manufactures DNA sequencers, arrays, and tools used to analyze and study genetic variation in living organisms. I'm gonna give the floor to you now, Omaima, to kick off the discussion with our impressive panelist. Thank you. Thank you, Layal, and I am honored to be your moderator today. Um, I would like to start by introducing our impressive panel members. We have uh, Lida Mina, Maud Champagne, George Vasek, and Rami Mahiu. And let me start by having each of you give a short introduction uh, to yourselves. So let's start with Lida. Hi, everyone. It is really my pleasure to join uh, this uh, great initiative. Um, so my name is Lita Mina. I'm a breast medical oncologist. I've done my um, medical school at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon a while back, and then came in for residency fellowship at Indiana University, then moved just a few years ago to Arizona. And I uh, joined the Mayo Clinic Arizona. My specialty is breast cancer, so that's uh, my main focus. Thank you. Um, Maud? Hi, thank you. My name is Maud Champagne. I, I work with Illumina uh, on a market access team, so I, I am not of Lebanese descent. I am actually from, from Montreal, Canada, uh, where I studied to become a pharmacologist and then moved into uh, biotechnology, where I've been uh, uh, for the last almost 15 years now. So I've worked on a number of commercial functions uh, between sales and marketing, uh, product management, and, and other uh, uh, business development type of role, and, and recently moved um, over the last few years, moved into reimbursement, uh, really passionate about uh, precision medicine and all of its promises. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that uh, reimbursement will be uh, one of the factors that will help uh, make precision medicine uh, ubiquitous and, and, and reach to more cancer patients. So thanks for having me today. Thank you. George? Thanks. Um, yeah, so at NVIDIA, I'm responsible for strategic development and genomics. My background is, um, well, long ago, I have a PhD in chemistry and, and did uh, structure-based drug design, but for the past uh, 15 or 20 years, I've been more on the technology side of next-gen sequencing. And um, so work with a lot of the top centers, uh, sequencing centers, cancer centers, um, and instrument companies themselves. Uh, we really work on developing faster and more accurate uh, analytical methods, um, leveraging GPU technology. And just to, to level set for everybody, I think everybody knows NVIDIA for sort of graphics and gaming, but um, really the GPUs are um, very useful for accelerated computing and AI. So every major AI initiative uh, involves GPU at some level. And so NVIDIA is involved in whatever, recommender systems and security and robotics and autonomous vehicles. We also have a, a healthcare uh, group that's very strong um, in this area, looking at medical imaging and drug discovery and smart hospitals. My focus is genomics um, and really GPUs can play anywhere in the analysis uh, for genomics. So from the sequencers themselves, um, doing faster and, and more accurate base calling on the data generation side to the, the secondary analysis pipelines, taking the raw data and, and um, converting it into useful variant information that uh, can then be used downstream. And beyond that, we're doing lots of different applications of deep learning throughout research problems in genomics. 
So uh, yeah, I'm looking at a lot of the problems that other uh, panelists have been talking about. And so very excited for our conversation today. Thank you, George. And Rami? Yes, hi, uh, Rami Mehio. So really glad to be here. First time participating in a lab, a lab net event. Uh, of course, uh, I'm uh, Lebanese, uh, came to the US in 2000, uh, in 1997, actually, I uh, was in Canada before. Um, I run the software and bioinformatics group at Illumina. Uh, I got to Illumina through uh, the acquisition of Edico Genome in 2018. It does feel like uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, so uh, Edico Genome brought Dragon, which is a, a secondary analysis tool suite, accelerated uh, computing uh, kind of in the same area as, as what George works in, a slightly different technology today. Um, and since then, uh, I've taken the role of uh, providing uh, uh, you know, greater set of bioinformatics, including interpretation, uh, software for our sequencers, um, uh, limb system, and so on at Illumina. So great to be here. Great, thank you. So thank you all again. And um, before I turn to the panel, I'd like to make a few comments as stable setters, um, as I expect some of our listeners are come from different fields of study. So we're living in very exciting times in the field of genomics and medicine. And some would venture to say that we are in a genomics revolution and compared to the industrial revolution in terms of how it's going to impact society and change the way that medicine is practiced. And this revolution is driven by the rapid pace of technological advances that have taken place in biotech over the past 20 years, and specifically in DNA sequencing. Um, so we now can sequence a human genome or the complete set of genetic material um, in a human in two days for under $1,000. So this is a huge advancement from where we were 20 years ago where it took 13 years and $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. So this decrease in cost and increase in speed has accelerated scientific discovery and the use of DNA sequencing to understand the genetic causes of specific disease and to target treatment specific to that genetic signature. And, and this is the concept of precision medicine where medical care can be offered in a precise and individualized manner to a person based on their genetic profile. So uh, as I said, now we can sequence a human genome or a part of a genome or a tumor tissue and look at the under underlying genetic cause of the disease. And arguably in medicine, the, the two fields that, have, um, that are, have made the most advancements in the use of genomics are rare undiagnosed disease and in oncology. So with that, um, let me turn to you, Lida, first, um, a practicing oncologist where precision medicine and genomics is put to practice. Um, can you tell us how you use genomics in your practice? Uh, so actually, I mean, you know, the approach to cancer has been completely revolutionized since uh, the era of genomics. So. I mean, we used to use it erratically here and there, part of mostly clinical trial, part of like experimental. However, at this time, it has completely like taken over our approach to every patient. So we use it significantly, not only in defining the disease, uh, like every, for example, breast cancer patient right now is being approached with the option of having the full uh, genomic sequencing done, not only to define their disease, but also to kind of know more about their prognosis, and most importantly, to tailor the treatment. So it has completely changed the way we approach the disease. It has become more what we call the precision medicine because we're able to tailor therapy specifically to the subtype of disease in every single cancer. So just to make sure I understand, the, the, the tumor, I assume the biopsy from a patient is sequenced and you're looking at that tumor profile. Correct. So when did you start using this? How, how recent? 
So we started using it, as I said, initially, like part of clinical trials, as soon as next generation sequencing, mid to late 2000, kind of became kind of available. Um, however, over the, it's been consistent on nearly every single patient just over the past few years, uh, initially and mostly advanced uh, stages of disease, and now it's working its way into early stage cancers. And before the use of this profiling, what was the standard um, practice, if you will? I mean, we always rely and still rely heavily on clinical, uh, basically, and histology. So, I mean, the main thing with every single patient is initially the clinical findings, demographics, uh, basically, um, everything related to their presentation from imaging to their history. Next, when we're using tissue, it's mainly relying on histology and the basic stains. And now we're taking it to more of a advanced level where every single type of cancer is subdivided into many diseases based on next generation sequencing or genomics. That's great. Um so given that this is a conversation in the context of LabNet and thinking about Lebanon, um, I have to ask you, you're at a very prominent institution at the Mayo Clinic. Um, how widely is tumor molecular profiling or next-gen sequencing used in smaller institutions or say globally? So, I mean, it is picking up everywhere. And partly is what you mentioned as far as the pricing changing. Unfortunately, there is still a lot of studies that show that there is global genomic inequities everywhere. And it's related, unfortunately, geographically, uh, race, socioeconomic, and it's still like a struggle in a lot of parts of the world to have access to that information. Yeah, yeah. So um, price, you, you mentioned you know, the, the price. What are other barriers? So how can we, you know, thinking of a bright future, what are some of the barriers that need to be addressed to drive more adoption and access? I mean, I think initially is spreading knowledge, like even starting with the actual providers and physicians, like there is what we call like some genomic illiteracy uh, all of us guilty of that. And uh, basically, we need to spread more uh, uh, knowledge. I mean, they have looked at what are the main obstacles, and some of it is the comfort of the provider in ordering those testing, and even more, their ability to interpret those results. So again, I mean, I think genomic literacy is the main thing so that providers become like comfortable with ordering those testing. Um, the other issue is basically technology is way more advanced than what we can handle at this time. I mean, we get a ton of information. We have much more mutations than actually drugs that can actually make a difference. So we're still kind of having all of this information and not knowing what to do with most of it. Uh, but again, I think, I mean, the financial burden remains a big, uh, a big hurdle. Yeah. This is a great segue, thank you, Lida, to go to Maud um, and ask you, Maud, about your work. So you're focused on working with payers and supporting the enablement of reimbursement. Um, again, thinking globally, um, maybe you can uh, speak initially about how, how various countries, as you see it, are covering genomic testing. It's a great question. Um, I think it depends. It depends what kind of genomic uh, testing and and how broad and and, and big and and uh, uh, of an essay or of a type of genomic inquiries that we're making. But um, you know, um, Lida, you mentioned of course your, your expertise in, in in breast cancer, right? If you think about uh, germline testing for BRCA, for instance, uh, I think the availability of, of of this type of genomic information has really uh, spread. Uh, 
rather rapidly in, 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 in a lot of regions of the world. We've seen um, even from, from national healthcare uh, type, of, uh, type of countries where they've actually looked into the, the financial benefits of wildly testing for bracket testing in, in order to be able to identify the individuals that are more at risk for cancer and have a, a little bit more of a pre preventative approach to, to care and maybe follow those more, more carefully. Um, you know, as we're kind of transitioning, uh, you know, over to, to germline, more to cancer type of, of uh, inquiries and tumor profiling, I think that um, the availability is great in the Western regions of the world. If we think about uh, United States, Canada, uh, to a certain degree, and, and, and most of Europe, Western Europe, uh, and some countries in, in Asia Pacific as well. Uh, but broad access is still, um, it, it's still, it's still a few years away, if, uh, uh, to, to, to be honest. I think, you know, you mentioned a great point about about uh, um, genomic literacy uh, from a provider perspective, which is uh, which is incredibly important. When we take that from a payer perspective, where you know it's a number of uh, oftentimes medical officers that make decision on covering or not covering certain essays uh, are not always oncologists. Uh, they have uh, not always studied genomics, or at least not recently. Uh, and and we really have to educate uh, a lot more as far as why those tests are important. What's the value of it? Uh, not only uh, from a provider perspective, but from a patient perspective. And they also have the same concern that you have as far as the amount of information that comes out of it. Um, so it's kind of explaining also that um, there is a long tail of different mutations that create this eligibility for clinical trial enrollment, uh, which is incredibly powerful from a, a cancer patient uh, perspective and, and at least being offered all the options available for treatment and, and clinical trial is one of them. Uh, so without this knowledge of the genomic uh, composition of a tumor, it's very difficult to be able to kind of offer all the, the, the broad area of, um, of solutions. So I think a lot of it is kind of, um, you know, educating payer on that perspective uh, and, and making sure that um, access is something that we can advance uh, um, to other regions of the world and, and even in the regions that are covered today, make it a little bit easier and, and more uh, accessible across different uh, uh, type of patients, that, you know, regardless of their socioeconomic or rural versus urban type of, of location as well. So there's still progress to be made for sure. Absolutely. So it sounds like, you know, the rapid advances in technology, it's uh, not only a challenge for the physician, but also for the payers and uh, it's happening much faster maybe than how payers are, are addressing coverage. Payers are not always innovator by design, right? So um, I think it's a, <laughs> we, we need to kind of support this kind of balance of innovation and, and a little bit more conservative approach to healthcare. Yes, yes. Thanks, Maud. So uh, George, let me turn to you. Um, you, you, you mentioned the, the, um, the work that you do at NVIDIA. Can you speak to it in, in, the, you know, in the context of the healthcare space? Sure. Um, so I think I, probably tying back to a couple things that both Lita and uh, Maud have said, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, AI strives to do is it, expert systems, right? Extracting knowledge from data um, and both enabling people who maybe don't have that level of expertise when you were talking about sort of ex equity of access, um, but also just fundamentally, uh, uh, Lita, I think, said about the, the number of variants that we, we don't really know, you know, what, what their, um, you know, the causality there is. So it, there's a lot there that can be done. Um, certainly, we are striving toward that on, on actively on projects today, both, you know, using AI to in, improve the accuracy uh, of, of understanding an outcome, um, and then speeding up time to results. Obviously, if you get the answer faster, then you can act more quickly to, to intervene with the therapy. And then ultimately faster also tends to mean, at least on the analysis side, lower cost. Um, I think kudos to Illumina and others over the years who brought this cost of sequencing down. Um, but if you don't bring down the cost of analysis in proportion, it's, you know, it, it doesn't help. Um, so certainly uh, lowering the cost of analysis. And that, again, I think helps to make people more willing to pay for it. It may, helps for equity of access across all geographies. Um, maybe a couple slightly concrete examples um, in the area of precision oncology. We're working with a number of groups trying to um, get better understanding um, uh, uh, you know, somatic mutations, um, in particular working with say the Human Genome Center in, uh, at the University of Tokyo, um, looking at uh, the results from multiple somatic collars. And, and I think 
every somatic collar has its own strengths and weaknesses, but by using a sort of consensus across them, we're able to extract or be more discriminating than by any single collar alone. So a lot of ways to apply deep learning there to improve results. And then you know, maybe going back to the, the faster, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, recent results. Um, we worked closely with Stanford, um, uh, you and Ashley's team there recently uh, put up, uh, did a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine um, on you know, the rapid identification of disease causing variants in using whole genome sequencing in, for critical care. And so there, I mean, they looked at everything. That wasn't just analysis. That was, we, we contributed to that part. Obviously a whole team, fantastic team involved with everything from sort of patient intake, uh, you know, draw, blood draw sample prep, sequencing uh, analysis to the final report. But we're able to bring that time down to seven and a half hours. So, you know, phenomenal job there. Obviously our small part on the analysis, bringing that in, in line as much as we could. So. Projects like that um, and many others, I think there's a, a lot of uh, cool directions that things are going. So. Thank you, George. Rami, I'm gonna ask you a similar question. So um, when we think about um, you know, this amount of data, we often hear about vast amounts, you know, challenges in data analysis, data interpretation, along the lines of what uh, George addressed. So can you speak to the role of bioinformatics in addressing these bottlenecks in precision medicine? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, look, it's it's uh, really uh, a part of exactly my career path uh, in in um, at Edico Genome that was acquired by Illumina. Uh, you know, we got acquired for two reasons, or maybe three reasons. Um, you know, Illumina uh, has been producing uh, an ever increasing um, accurate and uh, high throughput sequencers. Um, our customers um, struggle to keep up with the information coming out of sequencing. Um, Edico Genome uh, had a technology actually based on uh, FPGAs um, to basically speed up the analysis, but also has um, an algorithmic group that actually developed special algorithm for analysis. Um, those allowed us to essentially reduce the um, turnaround time for analysis of a whole genome, germline 30x uh, coverage to about um, uh, less than 20 minutes. We're at 12 minutes right now with a, with a single small server that costs $15,000, um, as opposed to something that ran in, in you know, uh, 20 hours or, or so. And of course, the uh, same technology today is used for uh, tumor profiling uh, with the big um, uh, gene panels, for example, the TSO500 uh, liquid or solid. Uh, they both run today on the Dragon technology and they, they run in, in sub hour times, even the, the highest coverage ones. Um, so exactly uh, this is one part where we, uh, we address the um, we have addressed the speed issue. Of course, once at Illumina, um, we came from a technology space uh, and we, we are now part of a group that has um, contacts in the industry, uh, in, in the uh, genomics industry with many applications, the Mayo Clinic and, 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 and you know, the Broad Institute and you know, the, uh, the UK biobanks and so on. Um, so we work with them and we have learned the needs. We've built them into algorithms. Um, we do that for customers with their own applications so they can process fast. Uh, we've acquired technology as well to compress the uh, data. So we, you know, we acquired a, co a French company to compress the data by a factor of five. You know, this volume that comes out of our sequences is so big um, that you know, at some point you're going to end up spending more money on storage than you spend on, on actually sequencing. Uh, so that's part of our uh, offering. Uh, managing the data in the cloud with our cloud uh, software, uh, ICA it's called as well, is a, another big piece. I, I do want to just add one, uh, uh, one part as well. Beside building sequencers and analysis solutions, Illumina does also provide uh, these end-to-end uh, -end tests, really their panels for uh, cancer. 
that you know you you use you sample prep with our sample prep kit you sequence and you use our software to get your end result and report um you know we have that for cancer we have it for um, uh, other applications covid seek is a great example actually where we're able to identify the strain of the very uh, uh, um, of the virus um you know we developed it in record time and you know we had to keep up with a huge volume once the uk variant uh, uh, showed up we, we we couldn't keep up so the speed was absolutely critical of course compression and so on as well yeah the covid is is um you mentioned covid seek um one of the outcomes of the pandemic i think is it made genomics more of a household conversation right so we're talking about uh, DNA and RNA and the differences in vaccines, mutations, variants, this is all, it used to be uh, very limited to the hallways, right, of, of uh, academic medical institutions. So Rami, maybe just expanding on that, we are focused on oncology, obviously, from a medicine perspective, that's where, as I mentioned, a lot of the advances are. What are other areas in precision medicine that, um, that you can speak to and where informatics is playing a role? Sure. Uh, you know, there's so many that are emerging. I don't know if you've uh, seen the uh, the venture capital market, certainly in San Diego has, you know, <laughs> exploded and, and many other places. And it's all about um, the applications, um, you know, that, that are emerging. So uh, pharmacogenomics, uh, COVID uh, variant detection, uh, of course, uh, companion diagnostics uh, uh, for, for cancer, um, you know, uh, people who basically would like to know whether whether um, uh, uh, they will be eligible for a transplant, uh, you know, they'll do the, the testing. Uh, I mean, there's so many applications like this. COVID-seq actually was quite interesting because the cycle typically of the developing precision medicine is very long. I'm sure um, Lida knows, but for COVID-seq, for us, it was uh, uh, about an eight-week period from start of assay preparation to final software with a emergency approval by the uh, by the uh, by the fda uh, and you know sequencing um, something like a, a, a million people or, or their viruses and being able to see in real time or every morning what strain is popping up in which part of which country amazing so it's really the applications are booming um and many many of them hmm. so basically yeah, any any um, uh, living organism, right? <laughs> you can you can interrogate the the DNA or the RNA and uh, get information. Um, let me turn back to to Lida and um, going back to oncology and and looking to the near future. Um, where do you see the next phase of using genomics in oncology? Um, this is very exciting. It sounds like you know we have it all figured out, but we all know we we don't. Um, I mean, you know, I don't know how near is near, but I think the whole goal is to try, I mean, the whole goal is to move away from like blinded chemotherapy for everyone to kind of very specific tailored oral medications. I think Maud already like mentioned BRCA. So now we have oral medications for uh, patients with breast cancer who actually have BRCA that is actually doing even much better than chemotherapy and with so many less side effects. And I think this is changing the whole landscape. It started with, you know, chronic leukemias with CML and the oral, like, and it's all based on uh, genomic testing and getting those targeted drugs that actually go after those specific mutations. We have seen it in lung cancer. We have seen it in colon cancer. And I think hopefully in the coming maybe five to 10 years, we're gonna be able to know more and get more targeted treatment. Yeah, that's great. And speaking of BRCA, so um, a mutation in the BRCA gene um, is inherited. It's a genetic mutation. And uh, I, you know, even popular culture over the past few years, um, we've seen it, right? Where women are screened even before the onset of, of disease and making personal decisions on whether they want to take the risk or monitor very closely. Um, is that something? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. 
Yes, I mean, we've had even in, uh, I mean, you know, uh, with, we call it the Angelina Jolie effect. So go. that actually kind of moved our clinics, our high risk uh, approach and helped with that awareness. And again, I mean, I use this platform to kind of let people know this is something that's becoming much more available uh, and very accessible. And any woman with significant family history with uh, even of not only breast cancer, but other cancers in their like first degree relatives, many cancers in the second degree relative, it doesn't matter maternal or paternal side, like either side of your family. I think this is kind of a, a wake up call for people to start pursuing those testing. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, I I'm going to turn to Mo. There's a um, an interesting question in the chat that I'm going to ask you. Um, is there concern with genomic mapping that insurance companies can get their hands on this private information and start refusing coverage for vulnerable individuals? So definitely, data privacy is is a is a big thing here. Oh, absolutely. It's such a great question and a complex one. Um, and, and it's almost, it's, I don't know to which extent it's, it's reimbursement versus ethics or both, right? Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how um, the protection of the genomic information um, is evolving, especially as technology evolves so rapidly and, and again in that genomic era. So we've already seen a number of countries taking a very hard stand on uh, what's happening uh, with genomic data that's, that's being uh, 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 created or, or on, on, on their country's population. So we're starting to see some legislation around it. Um, I think that as in a lot of cases, legislation always uh, is, a, is a few years behind technology. Uh, unfortunately, that seems to be to be a trend uh, and, and it's something that we have to be very vigilant uh, from, from a, an insurance perspective I think we've seen so certain certain payers actually taking the reverse approach in which sense that they're very conservative about uh, the type of genomic information that they would pay and reimburse um, in in the concern of having incidental findings that you know they would then have a responsibility to address <laughs> So, um, so, so it's kind of played, played on, on, on both sides from a payer perspective. You can imagine a world, of course, in which you know, if, if certain predispositions are identified, uh, it would increase premium or access to, to insurance, which is not so different than you know, high blood pressure that increases my, you know, uh, uh, um, I guess, life insurance, right? Some, something like that, uh, conceptually. But when we talk about things that we cannot change, uh, which is the, the inherited genomics that we have, uh, it, it definitely becomes something that we want to follow very closely. So it's sitting on the line of, of, of ethics and, and reimbursements, uh, but definitely the more legislation and guidelines around those area, we definitely welcome that to uh, remove some of the fear from a patient perspective, but also from a, an insurer perspective. So it's a great question. Yep. Um, let me stay with you with an, another question as you're talking. So you work in a technology company, you work in a company that is developing these tests and you're working with payers to kind of accelerate the adoption. From your perspective, how, how do you balance that and how do you accelerate the adoption in healthcare coming from industry? Well, something I'm really passionate about is, is kind of shifting the narrative away from cost, right? If you notice, I think the, the word cost has come up about three or four times already and, and just a little <laughs> discussion here. Uh, so shifting away from cost and talking about value, um, we're, you know, cheaper is important, right? Of course, cheaper, uh, but value is even better. So how does genomic in and of itself increase overall value from a patient perspective, from a healthcare perspective? Innovation is rarely cheaper. Uh, it, it, it costs to innovate. It's just a bit of of kind of a, 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 a byproduct of it. And we see that with pharmaceutical companies on a regular basis. From the diagnostic perspective, I think we're a little newer into uh, dealing with diagnostic reimbursement and kind of integrating the value into it. But if we're able to um, you know, truly highlight how increasing genomic knowledge of a tumor uh, in turns leads to better patient outcome, leads to better saving, leads to less side effect, uh, the patient benefits, the healthcare system benefits, the payer benefits, and that's where we create value. So I think we, you know, we talk a lot about uh, reducing the cost of the genome, and, and that's something that Illumina has done consistently in a, in a, in a wonderful way. Uh, but I also want to see a little bit more of that value going into the narrative and talking about how we actually uh, improve patient care and improve um, financial sustainability from, from a, a, an insurance perspective as well. And what do they say about moving, the idea of moving healthcare to preventive medicine rather than addressing 
right, uh, a problem after it occurs. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And preventive medicine is definitely the, 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 the ultimate goal. I think our, our US system is, you know, in a fee for service type of setting is not always thinking about preventive med medicine and all the value that it brings, but definitely as a patient, uh, I mean, I, I'd rather stay healthy for as long as I possibly can, right? Um, so I think that moving the healthier system in that direction is, is incredibly powerful. Right, thank you, Maud. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit and go back to you, George. You mentioned mm -hmm. as you were describing your efforts, artificial intelligence. I think AI and deep learning is are you know hot topics that are in in so many fields. Can you speak to their place in healthcare and in genomics? Sure, sure. Um, so I guess Rami mentioned a, a bunch of interesting areas that bioinformatics plays in precision medicine. And I think artificial intelligence and deep learning are just additional tools, if you will, very good and very, you know, right now, very uh, hi highly hyped tools of uh, that fit into that same story, right? But I do, do think that for many reasons, we're just coming into the golden age of, of deep learning. And in part, because in order to train these deep learning models, what, what deep learning does is extracts knowledge from data sets, right? The bigger the data set, the more accurate that knowledge extraction can be. And so uh, Rami mentioned UK Biobank, there's, there's many other national programs, um, you know, aggregating lots of data now. And so, so we're at a position where we actually have the data to, to start training these models. And so I think we're really going to see a lot happening in the next few years on this. Even now, if you look at the publications that are out there, they mentioned deep learning in this space, the number of publications has been taking off. Um, I'll kind of make a little forward statement though, I think um, of what things are happening now that are, are very exciting. And that's that deep learning, in addition to having uh, the large data sets available, more and more we're, people are starting to look at multimodal analysis. So uh, for instance, uh, hey, Rami's cat, um, <laughs> uh, multimodal analysis. So I think we all agree genomic information is powerful, um, but genomic information in conjunction with other information, pathology, uh, tissue slides, or, or patient rec information, uh, record, electronic health records, that kind of stuff is even more powerful. There are studies out there that show that for every modality you can add, you gain uh, discriminatory power. And so um, I think that's a, a critical area. Um, and uh, the other one uh, that I would say is, is federated learning. And this kind of ties back a little bit to some of the privacy of data concerns that Maude was talking about. But um, yeah, what you need lots of data, you don't necessarily all have it in one place. You can imagine for rare diseases in particular, you know, the number of individuals in any, that any organization is treating or any national geography even um, could be relatively small. And so it's, you can train against that and that's great, but it's better if you can get more. And, but you can't, <laughs> for all the reasons I talked about, take that data across you know, national lines and, and put it all in a big data silo to study it. So what federated learning does is it keeps the data wherever it is and you do local training um, on each of those and develop a model. And then you do transfer learning to pull, to aggregate the knowledge of those models together into a single central model. And now it is, more accurate, it's more generalizable. Um, so the whole you know, group can gain value from that uh, beyond what they could have done with their own individual set of data. But yet it still respects some of the privacies and so on. Yeah. So um, to, just to give one example of this, uh, we work with Erasmus Medical Center and through them in conjunction with the CHARGE Consortium, which is focused on heart and aging, not exactly the oncology topic we were talking about, but they have this exact problem where consortium members have data and they need to somehow study it. And so we've, we've been building um, you know, interpretable uh, neural networks to understand, uh, really get better understanding of the polygenic risk scores involved in um, those. But um, all of that is enabled by the idea of federated learning. So I think uh, watch this space, but yeah, over the next few years, that's gonna be taking off dramatically. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stay in this topic of informatics uh, and, mm -hmm. and computing. Um, I think, you know, as I reflect back on, on uh, 
on science, on, on what I did in, in the dark ages of, of my graduate work, right? It was one, a researcher would work on one uh, gene or one protein and spend their, their career. And so the amount of data that is now being generated is something that the community was not used to up, uh, until recently. So there's actually a question um, in the chat um, it seems that you cannot have enough computer power, uh, compute power for genomics. What are the next steps to get access to this compute power? Quantum computing, custom semiconductors, um, asking about AI, semicomputers. Rami, can you take that? Yeah, so uh, sure. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we, we, we have a very intense effort at uh, Illumina every year to check how we gonna keep up with the volume of data? Um, so, uh, uh, in general, you know, there's, um, you know, uh, uh, people used to follow Moore's law, where, uh, you know, chips got faster uh, because the transistor sizes got uh, smaller and so on, um, and and that at some point uh, stopped keeping up with genomic data growth, at least on our sequences, right? Uh, our curves actually are kind of crossed pretty badly. The 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 uh, throughput out of the sequences is uh, uh, growing at much faster rate than the um, than the uh, Moore's law can uh, can keep up with, and even then Moore's law seems to be slowing down. So uh, there's been a, a shift to basically saying, you know, let's go from generalized compute to uh, much more targeted compute. Um, the move that uh, Edico and Illumina did for FPGAs is one type of that. Uh, it, it you know did a, a 10x or 20x or 50x improvement. Uh, GPUs are another aspect of that uh, with with Nvidia. Um, uh, certainly, um, the uh, leaps after this is really for uh, quant uh, quantum computing. Is definitely an area that's uh, coming in faster than we expect. Um, we do have prototypes of uh, basic analysis with that. Um, I would say in the five years time span, uh, the problem with that is they're all going to be cloud-based, right? We 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 uh, we understand the need also for local-based analysis with privacy and uh, security, um, but also for custom ASIC chips, right? People can basically build their own custom chips that are not general purpose um, that has exactly what they need. Uh, with the most efficient uh, compute. Those are areas we're certainly looking at. Yeah, great. There's a follow-on question that's also interesting. Um, most researchers and physicians today lack informatics, informatics background. So how do you think we can educate them so they can easily analyze the data? And I see Lida is nodding, <laughs> agreeing with this. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I don't think, uh, you know, as a physician, I can ever uh, know what uh, George or Rami is like information is. So, like, uh, I mean, the goal for the physician and the provider is to be very familiar with that new technology and be able to discern what's kind of the specific that every provider has to know what they're looking for. And the most important is to be able to collaborate with uh, with people like George, like Rami, like Mode, so that we can put that whole picture together. They, I mean, there has been a lot of studies on AI, for example, and mammography. So like if you look into imaging and a breast cancer screening through mammographies, and if you use AI in general, you might be able to achieve like much better sensitivity in detecting than kind of relying on average on the average radiologist. However, the best is when you have a radiologist that's actually using that information and kind of using that background with a clinical information of the patient, and that's when you can achieve the best. So it's going to be like a matter of meeting midway. I mean, we definitely need to be familiar with the technology, uh, but I don't think we can be experts. Like this is moving way uh, beyond what a physician, I think it's going to be a collaboration between both and knowing your disease, knowing your targets is mainly basically have a good, uh, a good handle on 
on what's actually the main targets in the specific tumor that you actually have drugs for that you can actually make a difference in. Yeah, no, it's uh, absolutely, um, it's, it's ever fast moving. And this is really amazing to look at this, the set of panelists. We have MDs, we have PhDs coming from, um, you know, chemistry and, and computer science and elsewhere, and, and we're all converging um, on this conversation. Um, thinking about also data and the amount of data and AI, I mean, what is it that they say the human brain can discern maybe eight different data points and the ability to use AI to take in many more data points, going back also to, you know, thousands of, of uh, samples in databases and marrying those samples to electronic health records and the amount of discovery and understanding we can get when we have that, it's, it's really powerful. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's a very interesting question uh, that I'm going to uh, ask anyone on the panel to pick up, which is how much do you think it's important and helpful for results interpretation and for precision medicine to build a database of Lebanese genomes? Who would like to take that? Um, I can give it a first go if, if that's okay. But um, I, I do think that we know at least that certain populations are underrepresented in a number of database today, right? Uh, which are used to guide uh, innovation and development. Uh, so, so of course it, it means that the, what we create and what we find out is based only on a fraction of the world's population and not necessarily generalizable, sorry. Um, and I had a question for George earlier when you talked about this ability to have learning from different uh, uh, database in different parts of the world and putting that together. Uh, do you anticipate that to be a tool that will help in, in kind of adjusting that lack of, that lack of diversity that we have in database today? Or do you have any other suggestion on how we can tackle something like this? And uh, back to this question about the Lebanese population, of course. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you, what, everything you said, Mo, about, you know, underrepresented populations um, is, is absolutely true. And, and you know, uh, I guess just stepping back and taking an informatician's hat on, you know, if you're trying to sift through data, you know, to find, you know, an outcome and the data isn't there because that population isn't represented, you can't possibly find it, right? Um, so... I still think the efforts to uh, you know sequence different populations is very important. Um, that said, maybe what federated learning could do is if you know there are, as we know from the people on on this panel and and the community here, you know a, a diaspora of of Lebanese everywhere, right? And so it's perhaps they're already in, you know, some of the the other biobanks that are already there, it just need to be collected, a few here, a few there, a few here, a few there, and a federated model to try and understand them. So it, it, it could go both ways a little bit, but uh, nevertheless, I, I strongly encourage uh, more sequencing of, of underrepresented populations. So. There is actually a big move, not specifically like for the Lebanese community, but like for the minorities, specifically to do genetic testing. And like we have right now an ongoing like study that actually the Gemini study that's kind of targeting patients that are minority and offering genetic testing free of charge, albeit in patients with cancer. That, uh, but again, things are moving. And like George mentioned, like even with the regular uh, genetic testing and even with any of that, uh, if you don't have the data that is related to that population already like known, there is no way to figure out the details. And going back to the genetic testing and the, so that people are not too worried or afraid. I mean, in the US, the GINA law is supposed to be uh, like uh, basically helping, uh, I mean, basically protecting uh, the patient against like insurances, using that against them in the future. Uh, having said that, it's more like medical insurance and life insurances are not like under that hat. So there is always like here and there, but there is a big move to kind of help people get that information and still be protected. Yeah, there, there is, sorry, just maybe a, a comment here. In general, um, in population uh, uh, genomic studies where, you know, where um, 
finding a need to basically have uh, specific tools that are catered for that population. Uh, otherwise, the tools don't work very well. Uh, identifying um, uh, uh, references that actually match references is really essentially like like a picture of a puzzle uh, uh, for for that population. What we commonly use in genomics today may not be suitable for uh, all the uh, diverse population. Uh, so part of what we offer is, um, and you know, different groups are doing, is building uh, references that are specific to uh, certain populations. Uh, typically, the Lebanese are not too far from the rest, but but you know there are uh, areas that are certainly underrepresented from uh, in the most common references used in the uh, in the industry. Right, and um, I'll add a comment about the um, you know the diversity of of the of the or, or the availability of of data from uh, maybe a Lebanese or a Levant perspective. Um, I do, I do wonder often being in this field, how represented we are. Um, there, it's great that there's been a lot of focus now on minority populations and certainly African-American, um, Asian populations, um, uh, Latino population here. Um, and I often wonder, right, whether um, we are part of the greater European, as we, as we are, um, uh, you know, phenotypically very similar to uh, the, the white Western um, population, whether we're um, lost in that. Um, in the last few minutes, um, I'm gonna ask each of you a question looking to the future. So uh, Lida, starting with you, if we look towards the next decade, um, what are you most excited about in the field of genomics and precision medicine? Um, I mean, I'm mostly excited about prevention uh, and uh, hopefully reach a time where basically we can uh, have tools to uh, predict like uh, diseases and, and patients and uh, hopefully prevent uh, cancer uh, to even happen. Do you think there would be a time when cancer can be a, a chronic disease? We identify it early and just deal with it. Chronically. I think I'm lucky enough to work in the breast cancer field where, again, genomics has helped us to identify subtypes of breast cancer that are actually chronic disease. I mean, a lot, I mean, relatively, like 70 to 80% of our, our patients in breast cancer can have what we call estrogen positivity. And in those patients, a lot of those patients, we do tell them you have a type of a chronic disease and you can be maintained on medications for years. So we are getting there uh, and that's hopefully uh, getting better and better in all cancers. That's amazing. Maud, how about you? What are you most excited about? So many things. Um, you know, I, I think we're producing the, the success of breast cancer, another tumor type, right, where we're, we're often finding that uh, much, much later. And, and sometimes, you know, at, it's already at advanced cancer. So being able to kind of maybe replicate that, I'm really excited about cancer screening. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the ability that eventually we just go to our annual physician uh, visits, have a blood draw and, and, and be able to have a risk of cancer or at least a presence or absence of cancer. It's a nice uh, reassuring uh, negative, but it's also uh, potentially a good way to find positive early and, and transition uh, you know, a very uh, bad prognostic to hopefully something that has a better hope. So in my opinion, this will be a game changer in the way that we see cancer, hopefully uh, uh, in, in years to come and hopefully rather quickly. So. That's great, that's great, thank you. George? Well, I think I kind of, you know, shot my answer out earlier a little bit or pre-staged it, but I can summarize again. I really do think we're at sort of in a golden age now where there's starting to be the data sets that we need to really an analyze and, you know, applying tools like the federated learning we talked about and, and multimodal analysis really will start to extract uh, a lot more um, useful, you know, application uh, of this data uh, to, you know, real real diseases, real, real issues people, people are facing. So I think it'll re revolutionize medicine going forward. Thank you. And Rami, what are you most excited about? Well, I think it's not the future, it's actually today, right? Which is basically 
I don't know um, um, if you followed the news. We certainly at Illumina followed it very closely, but we did uh, acquire with some noise uh, a company called Grail, um, and you know we, we leave that to the how it goes from here. But the, the actual technology is about early cancer screening, right, uh, from a blood test. Uh, you know, a test that can detect 50 types of cancers at an early stage, just, you know, that eventually can be approved to be a, a regular test that you take at the doctor every year. Um, it's super exciting. Um, you, you're from a blood test, you can basically uh, uh, see uh, or, or decrease the amount of um, uh, 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 people who, who die from the disease eventually. Um, and and it's it's we, we're there or very close to being there. So very exciting. Amazing, right? The, taking a blood draw and testing your cholesterol and sugar levels and prevalence of early onset cancer is amazing. Well, we are uh, on time. Uh, so I want to thank all of the panelists. Thank you so much for your time. This was a great conversation. Thank you to the listeners. Um, I ask you to please provide us feedback on, on this webinar and any future um, ideas for future topics. And with that, I will close it. Thank you all. Thank you.